Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. A new twist in the Mateen Cleave sex assault case. You can't put earrings on a pig and have it not be a pig. The fact of the matter is this case is a pig. Cleve's attorney asked the judge to dismiss the case. The flakes have yet to fall, but the holiday season is underway. It's holiday nights at Greenfield Village. We're live with your forecast coming up. Donald Trump's attempt to derail the Michigan recount fails, but Attorney General Bill Schuette is mounting a challenge of his own. What this all means, we'll break it down for you. All right, Guy, but we're going to start things off at 5 o'clock with breaking news. We put his mugshot out just a short time ago and click on Detroit.com. This is Jesse, Ray, uh, Jesse Ruffin Sr. Police say he strangled and beat his own three-year-old son and that child's mother, and now he is in custody. We'll start there at 5. We got word of uh, Ruffin's arrest since we came to you with the 4 o'clock news a short time ago. Let's get right to Jason Colthorpe live with more. Jason, what have you been able to find out? A quick timeline here, guys. As soon as we put that alert out, uh, Ruffin was taken into custody. A short time later, police doing some good work on this one, finding him at his father's house on Beaconsfield. But all of this went down about 10:15 this morning at a home on Dawes on the west side. Police tell us that Ruffin went off after a verbal argument with that woman, a 28 year old woman. We don't know what that verbal argument was about, but we do know uh, the details of what happened are absolutely stomach turning. They say Ruffin beat and strangled the woman and just before she was falling unconscious later, she tells police she was able to see him going after the three year old boy, his own son. He beat and strangled him until he was unconscious. As a member of the Special Victims Task Force told me a little while ago when they were still on the hunt for this guy, there's only one way to describe Ruffin. A terrible person uh, to to assault a three year old child. Um, heart wrenching. Um, he, he can't roam the streets of the city of Detroit uh, committing heinous acts like that. It is absolutely horrendous what happened today and we won't tolerate it. And again, they have him in custody now taken in by officers just a short time ago. He is off the street. Now, if you can believe this, there were three other young children in the house that saw this go down. Uh, we don't know how they're related to the other children, but it was a nine month old, a seven year old and a nine year old that were there. They were unharmed. The mother and son were taken to the hospital. They are expected to survive. We're live at police headquarters tonight. Jason Colthorpe, local four. Jason, what else do you know about Ruffin? Did he did he have a criminal past? He did. He was actually described to us as having an assaultive past. Many reports filed against him. Uh, we don't know if the woman was his girlfriend or wife or ex-wife or anything like that, but we do know he had assaulted her before, Kim. All right, Jason, we appreciate it. Now to the statewide recount of Michigan's presidential results. It is going to go forward unless a court steps in at this point. The State Board of Canvassers deadlocked along party lines on whether to approve objections raised by President-elect Donald Trump and his campaign. Let's bring in Guy Gordon live now with more on what this means now for the process. Guy? What it means is that there's going to be a two business day delay, which is under the statute, uh, Devin and Kimberly, and that means the earliest, according to the Secretary of State, we could see this recount begin is on Wednesday, but a lot could happen between now and then. For instance, Attorney General Bill Schuette filing this challenge uh, in mid-morning, trying to block the recount on his own on behalf of Michigan voters who he says could be disenfranchised. Both this challenge and the Trump challenge, very similar. Stein alleges she is an aggrieved candidate because of unspecified mistakes and fraud. But objectors say she can't be aggrieved because with only 1% of the vote, she has no chance of changing the outcome and is offering no evidence. No fraud, no programming error, no claims of improper conduct, no claims of illegal conduct or any other fact whatsoever. They also allege it's impossible to complete a hand recount by the December 13th deadline. And if we don't complete it in time, citizens of the state of Michigan are jeopardized that their vote will not be counted in the Electoral College. That is unfathomable. But attorneys for Stein say proof isn't necessary. The bar is low and Stein made it. We would only allege that she is aggrieved in her petition. The objectors would try to restrict 
and read into that statutory language the right to a recount to the top two candidates. Republican canvassers say this sets a dangerous precedent. Every time we have an election, we could have one person with a write-in, register as a write-in candidate, and if they have deep enough pockets, they can throw our entire election system into chaos. Meantime, uh, the canvassers from the Democrats say that it was Donald Trump that began the discussion about voter fraud when he said that the election was rigged. They believe that this is necessary to restore confidence. Uh, now, in the meantime, there is a big battle going on about whether this is going to be a hand recount or a machine recount. The Secretary of State tried to go with machine. That was turned down by the canvassers as well. We're live. I'm Guy Gordon, Local 4. Devin and Kimberly, back to you. It's all fascinating, Guy. A lot of people wondering what's really behind Jill Stein's push here. It's interesting to see that her attorney, Mark Brewer, is the former state chairman of the Democratic Party, not of the, of the Green Party. Um, but I guess, uh, now, so now where do we go? What happens now? Well, it, you know, it all depends on who prevails here in court, and we may see that the Trump uh, folks file an appeal as well. But the shooting complaint is interesting because it goes beyond just trying to block this. He also says if the recount goes forward, he wants a machine recount. He's also asking that the recount uh, can't be completed by December 13th, the deadline, that they have to go with the original vote total that was certified by the Board of Canvassers. And he's also asking that if it becomes mathematically impossible for Jill Stein to win, not Hillary Clinton, but Jill Stein to win, that then they should stop it and move forward. And of course, that would be a low bar too. And this is this law really is so vague and so broad, Devin, there's no definition of aggrieved, no standards here. No one ever anticipated that someone getting 1% of the vote would mount yeah. a recount. Fascinating where we're headed on all of this. We will obviously be watching this through the weekend as, a, as to whether or not we get a, a decision from the court. Guy Gordon reporting for us live. Well, this week, two armed men held a family hostage and later set their home on fire with two small children inside. And now Detroit police are asking your help in finding one of the gunmen. The fire broke out early Tuesday morning on Connor near East Jefferson. During the home invasion, shots were fired. That led to a barricaded situation with a, in a standoff with police. And during that standoff, the two armed robbers set the home on fire, according to police, with a four-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl inside. The two-year-old remains hospitalized and in critical condition. Police have one of the suspects in custody and say 31-year-old Julian Coleman was the other gunman. If you have any information, police would like to hear from you. In Southfield, police have arrested two men in connection with a bar shooting that ended up leaving three people hurt. Two Detroit men are charged now with attempted murder. They're accused of opening fire inside Bar 7 last month on 12 Mile. The two are accused of shooting three men during a fight. They are now being held at the Oakland County Jail. A key witness takes the stand today in the Mateen Cleve sex assault case, and what he said may prove to be the key for the defense. That police sergeant who worked on the case says he doesn't believe a sex assault happened. Rod Maloney has been following today's proceedings, and Rod, we thought things would kind of wrap up today, not so. Well, uh, they're, they're not going to, Kimberly, and here's the thing. Money Township Police Sergeant uh, Todd Johnson was one of five officers who responded to the scene, and it was he deciding that there was no crime here. And he got on the stand today to talk about that. And it was not the prosecution who put him there. She says that she started to mess around in a sexual manner with Mr. Cleves, correct? Yes. She says nothing about any assault, correct? Correct. And she said she took uh, her own clothes off, is that correct? Yes. Normally, the prosecution calls police officers to the stand in a sex case, but not here. It was the defense who called Sergeant Johnson, who made the call not to arrest Cleves. What did you have at that juncture besides basically a disorderly person or a noise complaint? Nothing. His decision ended up overturned eventually. Prior to that testimony, though, Cleese attorney Frank Manley attempted to end the prosecution outright. He said evidence showing Cleves on his telephone during the time of the alleged assault shows there wasn't one. He's calling her boyfriend, which if we're going to go one step further, the person that she keeps saying I want called is my boyfriend. So Mr. Cleves is calling the boyfriend, texting the boyfriend, which is entirely consistent with what this the complainant said. Deputy Wayne County Prosecutor Lisa Lindsay continued her tough opposition. If he claims he was trying to get her help, how come he didn't call 911? 
himself to get her help. If he claims he was trying to help her leave the motel, how come he did not simply call her a cab? If he wanted to help her leave the motel, how come he simply, when she first said she wanted to go home, did not take her home? The judge did not rule on the dismissal, saying that she needed to hear all the testimony in the case before she can make a decision in that. They resume Monday morning. Reporting live with the news from Rod Maloney, Local 4. Okay, Rod. A big announcement from Ford today is the auto giant recalling nearly 700,000 cars because of faulty seatbelts. It's a recall that covers certain 2013 to 2016 Ford Fusions, 2013 to 2015 Lincoln MKZs, and 2015 and 2016 Ford Mondeo cars. Uh, Ford says heat generated when there's tension in the belts can cause the belt cables to break. That's a recall that's expected to begin January 16th. Dealers will fix the belts at no cost to customers. Weather not exactly perfect tonight, but a great night to be out at one of my favorite holiday events at Greenfield Village. It really is nice and Ben Bailey is there for holiday nights and Ben, it really is beautiful this time of year. It is a gem here in Southeast Michigan, guys, and of course the weather's only going to get colder, so you might as well come out early while it's still at least palatable out here, enough to keep the ice frozen out here. We're on the skating rink uh, at Greenfield Village, and I'll tell you, those temperatures making it feel like it is December. We've got the 30s out there. Wind chills have been running close to the freezing mark. You can see right now 27, the wind chill in Ann Arbor. Metro, the wind chill below freezing at 31. If you're heading downtown for the Western Michigan game tonight, kickoff at 7 o'clock at Ford Field, of course, it's going to be indoors, but that walk to the car a little chilly going to 34 after the game. Hopefully they come up with a victory and we've got your weekend forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Guys? Ben, some good news coming up tonight as crews work to put an end to the tragedy in Flint. What experts are saying about brand new test results and why residents say there's still so much more work to be done. Also, the cash goes flying. Wild videos, thieves burst into a beloved Detroit business while the owner says these guys should be pretty easy to find. Sean. A father of five gunned down right at his father's front door. This is my first boy. It's, it's tragic. Tonight, that father has a message for the gunman. New at six. A Detroit man is facing two new terrorism charges. The feds say he was stockpiling an arsenal of explosives for an attack, but their case against him has changed. We'll have that new at six. Nearly $1,400 worth of Bloody Mary mix, chips, and pickles stolen from the McClure's factory. Either somebody's planning one heck of a brunch, or we have a pickle bandit on the loose. Yeah, you don't want to miss this story coming up. All right, Jason. Tonight we are learning brand new information in the killing of a father of five in Detroit. Anthony Taylor Jr. was found dead just outside the door of his father's home on Huntington Street. That's near West Outer Drive and McNich McNichols. Sean Lay spoke to Taylor's family and has new details on the investigation. Tonight this family is absolutely stunned and they have a message for the gunman. Total disbelief and we a lot of things flashed past us. I mean, that was our firstborn. Anthony Taylor Sr. is a veteran, a father of three, and he and the mother of Anthony Taylor Jr. are stunned. It was our firstborn, it was our child, and I was always taught, you never bury your child. Not only does the mother and father now have to bury their child, but it was Anthony Sr. who found his 44-year-old son collapsed a foot away from his front door. I tried to give him CPR and uh, do what I could do, and I called 911, and he was, he was gone. It was just after 1230 this morning, Taylor Jr., a father of five, wrapping up his job as a counselor at a rehab center in Detroit, having a late meal with his girlfriend. She was on the phone with him when she heard Taylor say, oh, no, and then she heard gunshots. No, I didn't hear anything but gunshots when I came out. How many did you hear? About five, six. Police believe the gunman both knew Taylor Jr. and his girlfriend. Police found that person of interest and are questioning that person after finding a van police believe was used in the shooting. And tonight, Mr. Taylor says he wants that gunman to know that he took away his firstborn son, a father of five, and a very good man. From Detroit's west side, Sean Lay, Local 4.
All right, Sean, only one company has expressed interest in finishing the Wayne County Jail project. Yeah, officials hope to have, see several bidders for the project before the November deadline, but only one. One construction firm, nationally recognized one, however, uh, put forward a bid. Work on the jail, of course, has stalled for more than three years now. And despite the one bid, Wayne County Executive Warren Evans said he's confident and ready to determine whether that team is qualified. You mentioned a few minutes ago the weather isn't perfect, but it could be worse. This is true. <laughs> so let's, do, let's, <laughs> let's look at the think bright about side. the bright side. And uh, the bright side is what uh, Holiday Nights is all about at Greenfield Village. Hey there, Ben. Hey guys, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, just starting to get the spirit of the air doors open here at 630. It's the first night of many tickets still available. Uh, if you still want to make it down here uh, before the end of the year, I'll tell you though, temperatures outside on the chilly side to say the least bundle up if you're coming out the wind is noticeable 38 is where we're at right now in metro you start factoring in that wind that's 10 to 20 miles an hour and it's feeling like it's at or below freezing outside right now as far as the moisture goes there's not a ton of it across the state most of it is uh well up there to the north so we're going to spend the rest of tonight tomorrow and the start of the weekend dry then we start turning our attention to what we're expecting at the end of the weekend and that's going to be on sunday even though we start things out dry with a lot of clouds on Sunday, we'll start watching for snow to develop once we get into the afternoon and you'll see a quick burst here on the forecast map coming in and going out. Not going to leave a lot behind, probably less than an inch. And if we see any accumulation, it's going to be on the grass uh, and some elevated surfaces. And that's it. Temperatures get a little bit warmer into early next week. Not tonight, the overnight lows down to around the freezing mark. And with those winds, which are noticeable out here now, I'll tell you that, 7 to 12 miles an hour will relax somewhat as we get into the overnight hours. Highs tomorrow, very similar to what we saw today, right around 40 degrees. And then we start seeing those numbers move upward next week after that snowfall moves in. We'll get up as high as about 47 degrees there on Tuesday and uh, 46 and then start cooling down with high temperatures that'll barely reach the freezing mark on Thursday and Friday. We showed you the ice skating rink out here at Greenfield Village. If you don't have your own skates, you can get them for free. That's the price of admission. It's included out here in Greenfield Village and there's a tent down there at the end of the street. You can see it down there. Ryan Spencer's the general manager here at Greenfield Village. Tell us what we're looking at down there. Sure, we're looking at our Cheers tent. We are going to show you a 1945 Supper Club theme where we're celebrating the victory of World War II, the end of World War II. And you can probably hear, I hope you can hear some of our wonderful carolers as well right down the street. Uh, yeah, I think we can. So there's food all across the uh, this entire place, right? Yes, we have plenty of food. If you want your traditional chestnuts roasted on an open fire, we've got those. We have hot beef sandwiches and all sorts of uh, beverages as well. Very cool. It is night one of holiday nights out here in Greenfield Village and uh, tickets are still available for Fridays and Sundays. Fridays and Sundays are perfect nights to come down. We have plenty of tickets for those and um, we're we've got 18 nights. This is the first of 18. So come down and enjoy the show. Got it. And guys, if you haven't been down here, do yourself the favor and make it an issue make it a, a yeah. point to come down here this season. It is fantastic. Devin and Kim back to you. It sure is. I can vouch for the chestnuts. You went last year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great fabulous. time as always. Yeah. It yeah. It really is yeah. a gym. All right. Uh, Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with what's coming up. Doc. A highly contagious illness is popping up in school aged kids and there are lots of viruses hitting hard in all ages. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. I'll show you what's going around where you live. This is Tim Pampin on Detroit Seaside. It's for surveillance tape you will be talking about this weekend. The burglar who couldn't seem to keep his pants up. That story next. Check out this surveillance video. Thieves busting into a Detroit Coney Island and going to a lot of extremes to get to the cash. Our Tim Pamplin talked to the owner and shows us how it all happened. This heist taking place at Lou's Detroit Coney Island, seven mile and mound Detroit Seaside. They've been a fixture here for almost 20 years, helping out the community, churches, block clubs. But last week, someone helped themselves. Let's take a look at the surveillance tape, shall we? They started off going for the cash registers, ripping them out of the wall, smashing them on the ground. There's a closer look at this chap. A very distinctive hat. Marijuana leaves. He seems so focused on getting that till open. He didn't realize his pants were falling down. One more smash of that register and there goes the money flying. He then scurries around, picking up the coins, shoving them right down his trousers. Look at that, shoving the dosh right down his pants. Now that was the easy work. Now they move on to the safe. 
This is where his compadre comes in. Let's zoom into him, shall we? I spoke to a family member of the restaurant today. She's distraught beside herself. She says she's putting a reward out there. If you know who these two are, she believes they live in the neighborhood, called Crime Stoppers. They're offering a reward. She said she'll double it up to $5,000. This Coney Island that's been helping out the community now needs the community's help. That's the scene on the east side. Tim Pamplin, Local 4. Those are pretty good surveillance pictures. Probably somebody knows. Who. I'm, I'm thinking with the hat. Somebody yeah. would recognize. Yes, they are. Well, changes could be coming to Michigan voters who don't show photo identification before casting their ballots. Currently, voters without photo ID cards sign an affidavit and then are allowed to vote. But a bill to change that procedure gained approval by the Republican led House Elections Committee on Thursday. Under the bill, voters without ID cards would be able to vote, but they would have to then visit their clerk's office uh, within 10 days after the election to show that ID to ensure that their vote counted. New at 530. There's a lot of traffic coming into Ford Field, a lot of buses from Kalamazoo. It's like a stampede of Broncos fans. Yes, a lot of people rowing the boat. We'll hear from them coming up. A former NFL player gunned down in an apparent case of road rage. So why have police released the man who they say pulled the trigger? It's dinner. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 530 starts now. Surprising new test results in the Flint water crisis. Experts say major progress has been made, but there is still one very big problem. And we will start there today at 5.30. New numbers released today show what researchers call a dramatic improvement. However, some are still skeptical and leaders are still urging the people living in Flint to use filters. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester joins us and this is some encouraging news, Hank. It's very positive news. Numbers are trending in the right direction, but you listen to the mayor of Flint today and she says the big issue, the pipes under the ground, she says almost 30,000 now need to be replaced. The story is actually a, an amazing success story. Flint today, a much different story than just one year ago. New water quality numbers just released from the team at Virginia Tech showing what they call a dramatic improvement. Only 6% of homes sampled showing numbers that were concerning. This picture from a Flint hospital last year and from just a month ago helps tell the story. And here we are, we've got very low levels of iron, uh, associated low levels of discoloration, very low levels of Legionella and other harmful bacteria. Corrosion controls and the work of the people have helped improve the water quality. Researchers say flushing the toilets and running the water in Flint homes has helped flush out toxins. But just yesterday, a new report revealed the city may have almost 30,000 pipes that need to be replaced. So far, the mayor has been able to replace a couple hundred. Mayor Weaver also speaking out today about the situation in her city. As many as uh, 29,100 Flint homes need either full or partial service line replacements because those lines are either lead or galvanized steel. <clears throat> and if that figure proves accurate, replacing all of the lead tainted service lines could cost $140 million or more. So you listen to that number, uh, more than $100 million, and right now the mayor of Flint saying she's just not getting the financial support she needs to even continue uh, the project that she's been doing to remove some of the service lines. Again, the number's trending in the right direction, but the problem in Flint, far from over. Karen, Devin, back to you. All right, thank you, Hank. An Ohio man facing charges tonight after being accused of groping a teenager on board a Delta flight that was headed to Detroit. Strange story. The alleged assault took place back in July after the plane took off from Mexico City. According to the complaint, 31-year-old Glenn Dove licked a 17-year-old's knee and then grabbed her inappropriately. He's also accused of fondling another passenger as well. Former NFL player Joe McKnight was shot and killed on Thursday in a road rage incident in Louisiana. Witnesses say a 54-year-old man pulled McKnight from his car about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and shot him several times. Police brought the man in for questioning, but at this point he has not actually been charged. McKnight most recently played in the Canadian Football League, but his stepfather says he was working to get back into the NFL. The boy was just trying to make it back in the NFL. That's all he wanted to do. That was his whole dream from six years old. I've been knowing him from six. 
And for this to happen, it's just senseless. It, and it, it has to stop. McKnight was drafted out of USC in 2010 before playing four years in the NFL. He was 28 years old. The death toll from the Tennessee wildfires has now hit 13. Today, many homeowners there are getting their first look at the devastating damage as local leaders are facing some tough questions about whether they waited too long to order evacuations. There's only so many ways you can notify people. Uh, mass notification. You know, we can go to door to door, which we did do. Well, what we're getting into to is folks that don't know this area and got Monday morning quarterbacking. Officials say at least a thousand buildings throughout Gatlinburg and surrounding towns were damaged and destroyed by the fire. The exact cause is still under investigation, but the National Park Service says it was caused by humans. All right, now to breaking news. Uh, President-elect Donald Trump has now filed a lawsuit in an effort to stop the recount of the vote here in Michigan. Filed it today with the Michigan Court of Appeals suing the State Board of Canvassers. As we reported earlier, the State Board of Canvassers were deadlocked on whether or not to allow the recount, and a deadlock meant that the recount is supposed to go forward. So now the Trump team is suing. We will have more on this lawsuit coming up here on Local 4 News at 6. That news just in here in the last couple of minutes. Meanwhile, familiar faces going through the doors of Trump Tower today, though no new cabinet announcements actually expected until next week. That after he dramatically announced his pick for Secretary of Defense last night. And the transition team says the president-elect will be traveling again several days next week. Brian Moore has a roundup of another busy day for Team Trump. Brian? Thanks, Devin. The future president kicked off his thank you tour in Ohio with a rally that included some familiar themes. President-elect Trump is heading back out on the road next week and his tour de force performance in Ohio might have just given us a glimpse of the next four years. We spend too much time focusing on what divides us. He whipsawed between conciliatory and confrontational. Remember, you cannot get to 270, the dishonest press. And though he won, he still sounded a lot like he was still running. He apparently stunned his own transition team by pre-announcing his choice of General James Mad Dog Mattis as Defense Secretary. But we're not announcing it till Monday, so don't tell anybody. Mattis is known as a Marine's Marine. His nomination is probably striking fear into the hearts of many of America's potential adversaries. But the general retired in 2013, and a federal law requires a seven-year wait between active duty and appointment as defense secretary. Congress would have to pass a waiver. This is a part of, um, uh, in the fabric of America, the civilian control of our military. Meanwhile, good news for the Obama administration is good news for Trump. I didn't think I'd ever see the unemployment rate that low. It's fallen more than half. The unemployment rate dropped to 4.6 percent, the lowest level since 2007. While unskilled workers are still struggling, the stock market has been booming since the election. In Washington, Brian Moore, Local 4. All right, Brian, one other note. There's word New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is angling for a new position. Sources say he has told the Trump transi transition team members he's interested in becoming the next chair of the Republican National Committee. Ronna Romney McDaniel, uh, the current Michigan our, uh, Republican chair chairwoman, has also been named as a possible candidate for that. Analysts say it's more proof of a solid economy. New data from the U.S. Labor Department revealing today the unemployment rate hit a nine-year low in November. Last month, the rate fell to 4.6 percent. That's the lowest it's been since August of 2007. The new data also shows employers added 178,000 jobs just last month. Well, Ben is helping us all get into the holiday spirit tonight. One of my favorite spots. In fact, if you're not really feeling the spirit of the season, I would reckon this be my prescription. We'll be getting to holiday nights at Greenfield Village. Hey there, Ben. You got that right, Devin. And just to make you feel even better, we're in a Model T out here at Greenfield Village. I'm with my driver, Mark. Mark, let's go. Let's hit it. All right. Let's uh, go for a ride. We've got a couple of these out here, and you said these are 20 horsepower. 20 car. horsepower engines. And all the. All these are four cylinder, 20 horsepower, but they're surprisingly quicker than you would think. Very, very durable because you gotta remember back then when the Model T came out, when it was being built, less than 10% of the cars in the, or the roads in the country were paved. Now you were saying that this thing not only runs on gas, but 
It can run alcohol on it. It can run on kerosene. It can run on alcohol. So if I had a fifth of wild turkey from a party, I could just pour it in the back Most and we're good. Definitely. <laughs> it was very common. You have to remember back in the day where even if a farmer might not consume alcohol himself, it was very fiscally uh, responsible to have your own, still make your own alcohol, and you could run it in your farm equipment as well as in your automobile. And you were also saying that the, as these uh, cars became more popular, the prices on them actually went down over the years. Yes, Henry was always about lowering the price. Cars started out in 1908 at $850. By 1924, he's got it down to $550. Then the last year of the Model T, 1927, you could have bought one for under $300. Wow, 300 It's about keeping the price down, keeping it affordable. 300 bucks, guys, you could have one of these things, but you can ride in them for free. It's with the cost of admission out here in Holiday Nights. We're at Greenfield Village. Back to you, Devin and Kim. Oh, thank you, Ben. Perfect, huh? Oh, it just gives you the mood. I know, it Carrots, really does. Yeah. The lights. Well, if you're walking around downtown Detroit tonight and you hear someone yelling, row the boat, this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's the rally cry for the Western Michigan Broncos as they look to keep their undefeated streak alive tonight in the MAC championship over at Ford Field. Jamie Edmonds is in the middle of all the fun, and a really big crowd is expected for the game, expect, Jamie. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They sold 46,000 tickets. You might not see it right now. People are just starting to trickle into Ford Field. This may be the home of the Lions, but tonight it's definitely Broncos country. P.J. Fleck and the undefeated Western Michigan Broncos got off the team bus a short time ago at Ford Field. The only thing that stands between them and a MAC title? The Ohio Bobcats. Come on in, Broncos. Come on in. Broncos fans have been in town for a while. The two plus hours drive wouldn't stop them. Go Broncos! Roll the boat! Roll. There's not even a question how tonight will play out. We're rowing to the Cotton Bowl, just like my sign says. We're rowing to the Cotton Bowl. We're going to Texas. We're going to Texas. We were there when the gates opened. It's so exciting! Thank you. Thank you. You could call it a stampede. Oh, throw that boat! <laughs> Loyal Broncos fans who love PJ Fleck and all he stands for. I love P.J. Fleck. He does an awesome job with the boys. I really hope he sticks around. The last time the Broncos won a MAC championship was 1988. This fan was there. As she puts it, she's been rowing the boat for a long time. I was at that time. I have been supporting the Broncos for 45 years. That's right, she's been waiting a long time. Now back to the tickets. For the first time in a MAC title game, they're going to open up that upper deck. That's how many people will be filling Ford Field for this game. Now I mentioned 46,000 tickets. The most tickets they've sold to a MAC title game was around 25, 26, so they've doubled it. These people want a MAC title. They're rowing the boat. Here. <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> Very nice you work. <laughs> That's going to be really electric to watch that tonight. And the players and the way they respond to playing in front of a crowd I that know, day. No, what yeah. a huge crowd. Yeah. 46,000. Cool. Thanks, Jamie. Well, he's just 31 years old. He's worth tens of millions of dollars, and he just won the world championship. What this Formula One driver decided to do just five days after reaching the pinnacle of his career that's now trending worldwide. Also, the hidden problem with these new uniforms for workers at American Airlines. Why flight attendants say they got to go, right? A highly contagious illness is popping up in school-aged kids, and there are lots of viruses hitting hard in all ages. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, I'll show you what's going around where you live. Jeopardy! Has new at 6. A local family shares the heartbreak of the murder that robbed a little girl of her dad this past spring as the two brothers responsible learn their sentences. Co Cody High School in Detroit was using this tape as an agility ladder to test foot speed. Now they've got the real thing along with hundreds of other pieces of equipment. We'll have that story for you on Local 4. All right, Coco. And good health, a serious illness popping up in school children and a lot of viruses that are spreading quickly. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is here to show us what's going around. CVS Minute Clinic says their nurses were called on to give vaccinations after a pertussis outbreak at a Wayne County school. Now, pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is highly contagious and it can be deadly for babies. Now, fortunately, there is a vaccine available for children and adults, so be sure you're up to date on that shot. 
Now here's what's going around where you live. In Wayne County, that whooping cough is the most concerning. Everyone is seeing lots of upper respiratory infections, and St. John Hospital and Beaumont Canton are both reporting confirmed cases of influenza. Henry Ford in Dearborn is treating kids for RSV, strep throat, and a prolonged cough. Over to Oakland County, Beaumont Dr. Samuel Fawaz says tis the season for upper respiratory infections. Henry Ford Commerce reports lots of pneumonia, and St. Joseph Mercy Oakland is seeing a lot of patients with flu-like symptoms. CVS Minute Clinics in Milford and Walled Lake say sinus infections, sore throat, and coughs are the primary illnesses they're seeing. West of Washtenaw County, pediatricians at U of M are treating a significant number of respiratory illnesses causing cough, wheezing, and fever. In adults, it's upper respiratory infections and a few cases of mono. St. Joseph Mercy is treating a lot of falls, and they suspect people using ladders to put up Christmas lights is the reason why. Heading to Monroe County, ProMedica Monroe Regional is seeing breathing problems related to the weather change and asthma in children. Dr. Anthony Songo reports a lot of sinus and upper respiratory infections. Switching to Macomb County, Dr. Tony Bonfiglio at St. John Macomb is seeing bad respiratory viruses. McLaren Macomb reports a lot of coughs and colds, a few confirmed flu cases, and older patients suffering from pneumonia. Henry Ford Macomb in Shelby Township is treating strep throat and earaches. Finally, in Livingston County, St. Joseph Mercy Livingston is seeing a lot of coughs and colds causing congestion and says croup is starting up in kids. Covering your cough, good hand washing, and avoiding people who are already sick are the best ways to stop the spread of illnesses. And with flu cases on the rise, if you haven't had your shot yet, I'd do it as soon as possible. Back to you. Good reminder. Thanks, Doc. Formula One driver's decision to retire is trending worldwide. The world of racing was left in shock this morning when 31-year-old Nico Rosberg suddenly retired after winning the Formula One World Championships just a few days ago, and it's a decision that caught nearly everyone off guard. He had given really no prior indication that he was going to retire, but he says he's retired because he felt he had reached his peak and that he is at peace with his decision.